Hello, my name is June Edwards, and I am the um, Senior Topics Instructor, and I'm conducting our class now for spring semester through the Distance Education Program. This is a nonprofit class, and it is for seniors. Anybody uh, can be part of this meeting. And I wanna welcome all of you who are joining us today. I wanted to give you the announcements first before we go into our class session. And that is that uh, North Orange County Continuing Education or NOCE as it's known, has decided that uh, we are going to be meeting online still because of the COVID-19 restrictions. And that will be through the end of May which will be near the end of the semester course. And then what happens after that, we don't know yet. Um, we'll know more as time goes on. I know that um, in our country, they're planning on getting vaccines out to everybody who wants one by July 4th. And they're calling it Operation Independence. So this is something for us to really look forward to. Perhaps many of you have already received your first vaccine. I'm still trying to get an appointment to get mine. And I know it's only open to certain groups right now, but it will be open to other groups in the future. And they're planning on holding vaccination clinics in many, many different places. So this offers us hope. And for that, I think we can all be thankful. Um, the way I conduct the class, I usually do about a 25 minute or 30 minute lecture. And then I have discussion questions for the activity directors, which they can find on the Canvas program located at the noce.edu website. And um, this is all open to anybody who's registered for this class. So again, I wanna welcome you and say hello, everybody. The first thing we're gonna talk about today is the January calendar. Now we're coming in during the third week of January. So let's talk about some of the notable events and history that we wanna remember from the third week. Starting with around the 17th, uh, that's the birthday for Muhammad Ali, who was born in 1942. He was a great prize fighter. He was a boxing heavyweight champion. His name, uh, original name was Cassius Clay, but he changed it to Muhammad Ali. It is also, the 17th is also the birthday for Benjamin Franklin, who was born in 1706. And boy, one of these times, I could do a whole lesson just on Benjamin Franklin, who was a real Renaissance man. He was good in history, in science, in diplomacy, in the arts. And one of the things he invented was a music, musical instrument using wine glasses filled with different amounts of water. And if we get a chance, I would love to to share some of his music with you that a friend of mine recorded uh, about 10 years ago. Also, Sherry Lewis, a puppeteer, was born in 1934. So January 17th has a lot of things to think about. On the 18th of January, Raymond Briggs was born in 1934 and the author a. A. Milne was born, who wrote uh, some famous children's books. Now, on the 19th, we um, actually, on the 15th, I have to go back a few days, which was last Friday, I believe, was the birthday for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But we're celebrating it on the 18th, which is a Monday. And did you know that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is only the second um, native born American 
to be delegated his own uh, national holiday. The other one, of course, was George Washington. And people might say, well, what about Abraham Lincoln? Well, we include him and all the other presidents in President's Day, but his birthday was never made a official federal holiday. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in 1929 and we observe his birthday um, on the third Monday of the month. And we're gonna go back and look at some of his accomplishments in just a few minutes. Now, January 20th is always very publicized, especially after a presidential election because that is the inauguration day for a new president or for a continuing president for their second term. And that will be this uh, Wednesday on the 20th, and we will be getting a new president. It is also known as Cheese Day, where they celebrate uh, the many different kinds of cheese. January 21st is considered National Hugging Day. Well, uh, you can certainly hug your family members and those who are in your security bubble living with you because you've been sharing <clears throat> the same airspace for quite a few months now. But if it's somebody that does not live with you, they don't even want us shaking hands. They want us to do this elbow bump, which uh, I, I think is kind of strange, but that's, we live in strange times. What can we do about that? Also uh, the 21st, was the first flight of the supersonic Concordia airplane in 1976. My gosh, it just doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it was, and it was faster than the speed of sound. Then on the 23rd is measure your feet day. Well, I think when you get past the age of 60, your feet are not gonna grow any longer but sometimes they do get wider. And if you started with a double A shoe, you may go to a B or even a, a C or D width as your feet can spread out. And that's the I guess that would be why you would measure them. The 23rd is also National Handwriting Day. And I don't know how many teachers are still teaching handwriting, cursive writing in third grade because I know these days so many of the children are using computers and doing Zoom meetings from their homes and other kinds of face-to-face -face meetings via online distance learning, just like we are. And then the last one is uh, the 24th of January, Eskimo Pie Day. Those little, their little chocolate sandwiches with ice cream in the middle and they call it an Eskimo pie. You'll never believe when that was invented. It was way back in 1922. And I don't even think that many people had electrical refrigeration. They were still using ice boxes where the ice man would bring a block of ice and put it in a hole in the wall. And the ice was there to keep your food cool and he would come by about once a week with blocks of ice now I, I wasn't around when that happened but i have had people who remember the ice man and so maybe you remember having eskimo pie also when ice cream was made you didn't go to the store or wait for a man in a truck to come around selling ice cream like they do today I know as soon as, if my grandkids are visiting me, as soon as that man comes down the street, you can hear the songs and you hear all the kids up and down the street, ice cream truck, ice cream truck. And they run and beg a dollar from their parents and they run out and get something to eat. That doesn't happen so much in January. That'll be more when it's warmer months. Also on the 24th of January, California remembers that day because in 1848, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill. 
And that was in 1848 on January 24th. And it set off what later became known as the gold rush of 1949. Well, that's as far as I'm gonna take you. I'm just looking to see if there's any other holidays to remember or special events or national proclamations, but it looks like we've got them all covered. So the next thing I want to do is talk to you about this man, Dr. Martin Luther King. Now I was trying to find some pictures that were not copyrighted that I could put up on this recording to show you, but I, I don't have that. But what I do have is 10 things that you may not know about Martin Luther King Jr. Now, why do we do this? Why do we have a class like this? Sometimes I nickname my senior topics class the Brain Health Awareness class, because in this class, we are trying to create new brain cells by going over old information and new information and talking about it and mentally stimulating our brains. And that's what we're doing today. So we're gonna go back in time and think about when we first heard about Dr. Martin Luther King. I know I was in school, um, I don't remember what year, but you know, it wasn't until the early 1980s that every one of the 50 states agreed to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, life you know, as a national holiday. So it, it took a while, it took about 20 years for a lot of people to begin to accept that they wanted to celebrate that. Yeah, but his name did not start out as Martin. His original birth name was Michael. He was born Michael King Jr. in 1929. But in 1932, his father, who was a pastor of Ebenezer, Baptist Church traveled to Germany kind of on a pilgrimage and he visited the many sites associated with the Christian reformer Martin Luther. He was so impressed by the Protestant Reformation leader that he decided to change his own name and that of his son to Martin Luther. So that's how Martin Luther King Jr. became known as that. Now he entered college at the age of 15. This was one smart young man. His mother was very educated for that day. She had a college education. She was a teacher and she taught her children outside the classroom as well as in the classroom. His father was a very prominent Baptist minister, as I mentioned before, and they were pillars in the Black community where they lived in the South. So he grew up in a very well-respected home and had a great education. He was able to skip the ninth grade and skip the 11th grade. And so he graduated high school and was able to enter uh, at Morehouse College, you know, at a very, very young age. That was the alma mater of his father and his grandfather, both of them. He did not intend to become a Baptist minister himself. He went through a period of doubting his Christian upbringing, and he thought he would become a doctor or a lawyer. But after careful consideration, uh, a noted theologian, Benjamin E. Mays, who was the president of Morehouse College, convinced him that he should become an ordained minister. And he did at the age of 18. And then he went on and got a divinity degree from Pennsylvania's Crozer Theological Seminary. And he also went to graduate school at Boston University. He got his PhD in 1955. 
and he began studying uh, nonviolent ways of resisting the injustices in the world. Two of his heroes were, um, uh, what was his name? Henry Walton Thoreau, who is a famous philosopher writer in the 1800s and also Mahatma Gandhi, who was very important because he helped India throw off its colonies shackles by Great Britain. And they did it with passive resistance. They were called pacifists. And King was, Dr. King was very, very interested in that he did not like violence at all. He abhorred it. He did not also like injustice. Now, when he was young, you know, the black children had to go to a different school from the white ones. There was segregation. They could not use the same bathrooms, the same restaurants. They could not shop in the same department stores or in the same section of anything. They went to separate churches and they could not vote, even though they had been given the right to vote as far back as the days of President Abraham Lincoln with his Emancipation Proclamation. But many states were not letting them do anything. And he did see the injustice of this. So his first national speech was given uh, at a prayer pilgrimage for freedom on May 17, 1957, before a crowd estimated it between 15,000 and 30,000, he delivered his first national address. He urged America to, quote, give us the ballot. And he got strong reviews and became a leader after that of the civil rights leadership. His first protest was probably because of Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat on the bus in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And King and others organized the boycott of public transportation. And <clears throat> after more than a year of refusing public transportation, they were finally able to persuade the city politicians to let the Blacks sit wherever they wanted to on the bus. And at that time, the Baptist ministers and other church ministers from all over the South organized a new civil rights movement and made King the leader of it. He was thrown into prison almost 30 different times. You know, he did suffer a lot for his beliefs. And he was arrested for acts of civil disobedience and charges that were made up. He was jailed in 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama for driving 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. Not even a warning ticket. They put him right in the jail. He narrowly escaped an assassination attempt a decade before his death when a woman stabbed him in the chest and he did recover from that. You know, he, he suffered a lot. <clears throat> they said after he died that even though he was only around 35, 36 at the time of his, his death, that he had the heart of a 60 year old from all the stress and all the burdens that he had to bear during this. In his last public speech, in a way it foretold his death. He came to Memphis, Tennessee in April, 1968 to support the strike of the city's black garbage workers. In a speech on the night before his assassination, he told an audience, quote, like anybody I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place but I'm not concerned about that now. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. 
and I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You know, it was really interesting that uh, this man had such a way with words. I remember I was teaching fourth grade many, many years ago, and we were getting ready to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I played excerpts from his speeches from um, videotapes that I had from the school's library. And the children at nine years of age sat as if they were in a trance and they listened and they listened. I must have played at least 20 minutes from the I Have a Dream speech. And it was amazing what, <clears throat> how that impacted them and how they listened to this man at nine years of age. And I strongly urge you, if you have access to a podcast or something that your, that your activity director could play part of this speech for you, or perhaps you'll hear it throughout the day being offered on different stations of TV or radio. I really suggest you listen to it. And then, you know, he was assassinated by an escaped convict, uh, James Earl Ray. And some people believe that the mafia and the local, state, and federal government agencies were deeply involved in this murder. And his wife, Coretta, Coretta Scott King, always believed that. Um, and in 1999, there was a civil trial in which a Memphis jury did decide that Dr. King's assassination was the result of a conspiracy and that Ray was set up to take the blame. So we know that George Washington is the only other American to have had his birthday observed as a national holiday. But Dr. King and his life accomplished so much for the civil rights movement. And today, children of all races can go to school in the same place. They can ride a train or an airplane or a bus or in a taxi. And they don't have to worry about having an inferior education or being treated the wrong way. So it's, it's amazing to me. I think I have a picture here. I wanna see in all of my writing. Oh, and he did get the Nobel Peace Prize at the age of 35 in 1964. He's a young man. But his I Have a Dream speech, I wanted to show share with you just a few of the words. I know I'm speaking a long time on one topic, but this is such a special man. And in this day and age, I think we need to share the greatness of this man. He says, <clears throat> it would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro, and that's what they called blacks in those days, Legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, 
will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today. This is our hope and this is our faith that I go back to the South with. And with this, we pray that this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside, let freedom ring, let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. And when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, every state and city, we can speed up that day when all of God's children Black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And I just, I just love the words that I am so glad I have a transcript from that speech that he gave in front of the Lincoln Memorial, which he called hallowed ground. Well, I'm gonna take a pause and get a sip of water. We only have a few minutes left and I certainly don't wanna go over my time. I do hope that you are uh, thinking about our goal as a class of being lifelong learners and that you will come up with some good goals for the new year. You want to try to have three to five goals, make them doable, make them something about your health. <clears throat> Maybe try to take a walk around the hallway or if they will let you take a walk around the perimeter of your parking lot. Try to get more sunshine, soak up that vitamin D Try to have a positive attitude. And remember that 2021 is our year of hope. Create a plan that will allow you to crush your 2021 goals. You can learn to live each moment in wonder and awe. Instead of the glass being half full or half empty, we wanna look at it as full and we want to be optimists in this year. And it's so good. It's so good that I can talk with you. I know it's been about five weeks and some of you I'm meeting for the very first time. And I hope to share so much more with you in the weeks to come. God bless you all. And I hope you have a pleasant rest of your day. Bye everybody. See you later.